This video is brought to you by Bitbox NES Game Cases. There's no better way to protect, store, and display your NES game collection. Only available at stoneagegamer.com forward slash bitbox. Hey guys, what's going on? This is John with GameStreet81.com. I'm here with Joe Cody from Atari2600.com. How you doing, Joe? John, it's good to see you again. Good How to are see you again. So we have a very rare uh, system here in front of us that we're going to review and, and show you guys. Uh, Joe, what do we have in front of us? What we have in front of us today is an Atari 2700 uh, video game system. It also was known as the Stella RC, which was the Atari's name for the system while it was in development. And it was also called the, um, uh, I think it was called the Remote uh, uh, Control 2600 system, but uh, primarily it's called the Atari 2700. Wow. And so this came out in 1981. And well, what, what is it? I mean, how is it different than well, uh, Atari when you, 2600? You're right about the date, 1981 is significant, but it never came out. So came out, right. really, okay. it was actually the way I describe it is it was in development at Atari in 1981 for release that year, but it never made it to release. So it's a prototype system, meaning that it never was sold or available in a store at any time. How many of these things do you think are in existence today? Well, you know, it would be interesting to, to try to track down every one of them in existence. I think a reasonable estimate would be 10, and I think that it's somewhere probably less than that, about five or seven. Wow. Uh, I personally have seen two of them, two different ones. Um, a third one that was online, and I know that uh, there was two more in California, so what would that be, five? Wow. So, you know, we're pretty small quantity yeah, here. Yeah, sure. So you basically had to be an employee at Atari during this time to really get your hands on one of these. Yeah, and you know, they obviously weren't meant to be uh, shown to the public or used, so these would have been for only for internal use only. It hadn't uh, made it to the point where it had been, like, shown to other retailers. It was really an internal product and only meant uh, for people that were engineers, hardware engineers at Atari at the time. And you had an interesting story, backstory about this particular machine. You want to I talk know. About that real quick? I, I think it is an interesting story because these things are so unusual. They kind of come with um, the history behind them is also interesting. This particular system was um, owned by a gentleman in Texas who had previously, as a child, lived in the uh, Bay Area of San Francisco near Atari headquarters where the system was in development. The story that I received from him was that as a young boy, um, uh, his mother uh, was dating an engineer from Atari and presented him with this system as a gift one day because um, uh, it obviously, uh, probably what the situation was, Atari had maybe abandoned the project at that time. The guy thought it would be a great idea to give his girlfriend's son a video game system to play mm -hmm. with. And anyway, that's how he acquired it. Uh, the only other piece of information was he remembered growing up with the system. It was his regular system. He played it all the time. It was his Atari 2600 system. When friends would come over or if he would go to visit other people, he'd notice that his system always looked different than everybody else's Atari 2600 systems. You know, it had wireless controllers, which we'll look at in a second. But it's an interesting thing that to him, him at the time, it was just his... It was just his Atari 2600 system that he used and enjoyed just like anybody else. Nothing right. special. Gee, thanks, mister. Yeah, I guess it was kind of an interesting, you know, I, you, could see the, you could see the wheels working. Maybe the guy had, you know, maybe he was interested in <clears throat> dating his mother. Maybe he wanted to, you know, give something to the kid so that the kid would maybe like, you know, endear himself. And yeah. Anyway, um, I, can, I don't know, I can't about the relationship itself, what happened after 1981, but yeah. that's how this system left Atari and made it into the hands of a private individual and why it still exists today, I'm sure. If it hadn't been for that situation or instance, it probably would have been discarded and wouldn't exist today. Well, let's take a closer look at this and sure. talk about it, okay? Okay, absolutely. Okay, Joe, so we have the system in front of us. First thing I notice, it looks like a very small version of the Atari 5200, as far as design goes, almost. I, I agree with you there. I think that the uh, wedge shape, which is how you describe it, is absolutely, uh, this would be a predecessor of the Atari 5200 design. Even the 7800 design had a, a, a tilted wedge to it. Maybe even the junior you could throw into that camp. Yeah. It certainly kind of uh, was a predecessor of the appearance of all Atari systems that sort of came after. I love the color. It's almost like a dark brown. This is a very subtle brown color to it. It yeah. is. In the bottom corner here, you have, it says Atari, and it has the radio, of, wireless. radio waves. Explain to us why they, they're using the radio waves there. Well, the big feature with this particular system would have been its wireless hand controllers, which was novel at the time. You didn't see it with any of the other competing brands, uh, like in television or Coleco or, or, or either Atari products. And so uh, the wireless controllers were really the feature of the 2700 system. It was uh, novel. 
And I'm going to go ahead and lift this up. This is the dust cover. Again, I think it uh, is very representative of what we saw with the 5200 system, mm -hmm. also with the dust cover on the back mm -hmm. of the game console. How heavy is the system itself? Um, that's not what bad. would you say? Yeah. Probably about four pounds. Four or five pounds, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yep. Um, the other feature about this system, which was different than anything at the time, was the front panel here uses uh, touch switches. And I'll go ahead and I'll plug the power supply, the power adapter cable, which goes into the side of the system. And it's, a, it's a different outlet than you would find in a normal It is. It was powered system. with the same 9 volt DC uh, power adapter as a 2600 system, but the, uh, the, 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 the uh, connector itself is a barrel type as opposed to a pin type. So okay. I'll go ahead and plug that in. It goes into the side panel over here. And you'll notice right away once it's plugged in and turned on that we have LED panel on the front. That's pretty interesting. You, again, that was something that you hadn't seen. Normally you had a big clunky switch that you had to manipulate. And if you wanted to change any of the options, go ahead so and you can you do- have local, you can do, like, you can plug in remotes on the side. That's right, that would be if you had to, there's a panel here on the side, which you can see it has uh, a left and a right uh, nine pin joystick port. You could plug in any joystick or paddle controller, or any other type of con standard Atari joystick controller. This is to switch to the remote, you just, it's a touch you, thing, you it's You would, cool. exactly. It's, you can see that you don't even need to really press on it, it actually no. recognizes your finger location, maybe hmm. just slightly on that one, there you go. Huh. And that was another interest. I mean, it's a slim, clean, modern look. High tech You're thinking, early 80s. This system, again, we mentioned earlier, was in development at Atari in early 1981. I know from looking at the chips inside one of the controllers, it has a date on it, and it was the third week of January. So we're talking really probably 1980, 1981. When this system was in production or in development at Atari, Atari hadn't even released its four-switch version of the 2600 system. Only hmm. at, and this time they hadn't even come out with that. So this is quite early for Atari to be tackling such an advanced game system. I wanted to show the, some of the uh, features of the controller, which sure. are also kind of interesting. Look they, at the antenna there, that's pretty wild. I know. I, I guess you had to, well, the flexibility Same for shot. safety concerns, but let's get that. Maybe would it be okay if it was here? Sure. Okay. Uh, you can see the same logo. This one I picked up has an R next to it on the bezel. This would be the right controller, and the other one has an L, and it would be the left controller. Uh, you can see it has the touch-sensitive uh, select and reset, which was a nice feature. You could be, in, at the end of a game, instead of having to use the reset switch on the game console, you could just use your hand controller from your sitting position. Certainly, it would be a lot nicer. Here's something that you probably didn't recognize right away. This actually is a built-in paddle controller. Yeah, kind of like with the Coleco Gemini. Almost it's like exactly. It. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Uh, the Sears uh, 2800 uh, um, uh, had the same thing. Or, I'm sorry, the Video Arcade 2 by Sears. Mm -hmm. But it's nice. It has a built-in, and then it has an eight-position joystick. Uh, and then there's your a fire action, button yeah. on, on, on the left-hand side of the control panel. And on the top is your on-off. And it, it runs mm -hmm. off of what kind of battery? It is has it? a 9-volt battery tray mm -hmm. on the back. Uh, it's right back at the top here. And uh, um, it's actually, the, what I like about the controller, if you feel it, it, it feels good in the hand. It's not clunky, maybe like a 5200 system controller. I mean, it's a good, comfortable size. You know the later, the wireless Atari joysticks that came out much later? They're like a big square uh, mm -hmm. cube. I think that these wireless controllers are far better than the ones that Atari did eventually release, um, which are so large and, and uh, awkward. So they're really kind of a nice controller. And here's the left-handed controller. And you can see that you can do the game reset or select right here on, this, on the game console itself. But I imagine most people would probably prefer to use the convenience of the uh, handheld select and yeah. reset switches. One thing inter interesting about these particular controllers are the range. Uh, their radio range can up to a thousand feet, <laughs> so it was almost excessive where it would interfere with garage door openers, TV remotes, and other rooms. Mm -hmm. And they you explain to us kind of what happened with the FEC or uh, you know, FCC or what. The information that that we have today about the the, the reason the question is well, why did Atari not release this Super Twenty Seven Hundred system, which should have been successful in the marketplace? And what we know from today from uh, people that were around at the time is that. The controllers themselves, like you mentioned, had a very powerful wire, wi uh, wireless uh, radio transceiver in it, meaning for receiving and sending radio signals. In yes. fact, up to a thousand foot range, which is your, not your neighbor's house, not your other neighbor's house, but three neighbors down's house <laughs> would still be affected. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's a long distance, yeah. all right? So um, the, reason that the, the, the real reason that it was canceled and not allowed to go into market was that the FCC has to, in the United States has to license any type of a radio operated device. And what they do is they test it for interference with other radio controlled devices. So this system failed to receive FCC approval and therefore it could not be released. Atari could have gone back and perhaps redesigned it or re-engineered it to make it pass that government, strict government test. 
But for whatever reason, they didn't. And wow. here it is today. And here it is today as a prototype, never released. And we should probably clarify, this is basically a 2600 system. Right, right? that's I mean, a plays, good question. There's it, it, no enhancements like audio, video enhancements. This internally operates on the exact same chipset as an Atari 2600 system. Uh, you can see the cartridge slot and so forth. It, the, the features are more um, operational and convenience, not better graphics. Or, or It's not a 5200 system. Yeah, very cool. Um, there's a couple things on the system. I mean, one of the nice features about this one, John, is the original dust cover being in place. These things are fragile. Um, I'm just surprised that it didn't uh, either become damaged or broken after all of these years. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there is a bit of a uh, spot, and you can see it. It's showing up in your uh, video just right about here where there's a crack that's been repaired in the front case. And, I mean, that's just, it, it looks okay. It's still all there, but it does have a, 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 a wound, I guess you would say, at the front of the system. Operationally, though, um, this system works great as far as picture and sound quality. But the, uh, the controllers on this system, unfortunately, do not work. And there's a reason for that, and I don't know if you want to get into the technical reason on it, but the short story is, when this system was in, as it was built, the Atari was customizing a lot of the features here. They hadn't gone into production. And in the controller case, what they had done was they custom built a chip that's inside of the controller. There's a corresponding chip inside of the game system. Let's point to that so it's in the shot there. Which, what, what, what the chip does, it encodes the radio signal between the system and the controller. So it's called an encoding chip. And you can see it if you remove the back of the panel here. The chip, the encoding chip inside of this controller and inside of the other controller has failed. It has an Atari part number on it and there is no replacements available. They probably only made 20 of these chips or 50 of them, just enough to do the prototyping work. If it had gone into production, they would have made millions of them as they normally would have. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, those chips have failed electronically internally, and because it was built as a custom chip only one time in small production, no replacements are available for it. So it seems like at this point, the controllers are just, um, doomed never to be operational. But you can use the original controllers as well, just plug it in the you side. You can plug in and the system, and we've certainly done that and tested the operation. The system operates just as a normal 2600 system would. Works fine. And you mentioned, you pointed something out interesting earlier. Yeah. On the very bottom here, I'm gonna be careful. I'm gonna unplug that for you. Sure, go ahead. But uh, there's no stamp or there's no date. No, I mean, there's, no. It, you can see it's a prototype stage right here. Usually that would be kind of an area where there'd be like an embossed there's a hand-labeled sticker on there, which doesn't mean anything to me, but it means something. It has a 07004. And just like um, the 5200, you have a little cable thing there. Exactly. Yeah. That's, another, uh, that's another innovation, which um, uh, you saw later on with the 5200, which would have been in development at a similar point in time as this. It was uh, The 5200 was released a year after the development of the 2700. But still similar family. What would you put the value of this worth? You know, it's a good thing to talk about would be the value of something like this. And, 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 and this value on this system depends really on the uh, individual that wants to add it to their collection. Meaning that these things sell so infrequently that it's really hard to come up with an average price or what a fair price would be. One of these systems sold in 2008 on eBay. It was missing the dust cover and it had been engineered where these, all these touch buttons had mo been modified to put a regular button. So I think it was really was an engineering piece. It was not this pretty. I mean, the panel had all been drilled with uh, push buttons, and this was missing. It sold for over $5,000 uh, in an eBay auction. And so um, this one, with the controllers not working, but with the dust cover, it has this panel which has not been drilled and modified. It does have the damage. I feel that the value on this system is up to $8,000. Yeah, and it's for sale on your, your site. I know, and, yeah. it, and it is for sale on the site, and it seems like a lot of money, but when you consider the rarity and the de desirability of Atari 2600 collectibles, it's in line with other uh, video games that are just as rare and so forth. So I think it's, it's reasonably priced at that point. Great, Joe. Thank you so much for your time and showing us this great piece. Appreciate it. You're welcome, it. John. Thanks a lot for coming over.